Hello, hello, welcome to the video and happy Australia Day. Like all of my most recent cryptozoology videos, I've started this off by saying those familiar with my channel will be aware of my interest in alien big cats, particularly the Australian ones. Livestock killings, strange tracks, and much more all make it one of the most interesting cryptids that I've heard of in my own personal opinion. However, just because it's something I've talked about often doesn't mean it's famous. Just from my own personal experience from talking with people about them online and offline, they seem like very obscure critters with the only popularity they have being limited to Australia. So for Australia Day, rather than make another Alien Big Cat video, I thought it would be best to cover one of the more famous cryptids of Australia. Since I got my hands on Bunyips and Bigfoots and Out of the Shadows, I've been interested in making some other Australian cryptozoology videos. As you may have guessed from the title, I've decided to start off exploring other Aussie cryptids with diving into the history of the Bunyip. I'd also like to note beforehand that some parts when making this video honestly did my head in, so I apologise if there's any parts that get confusing or where I make a lot of mistakes. Anyway, on with the video. One thing I've heard often said about the Bunyip that you might have also heard is that there appears to be no consistent shape attached to the animal, with the word Bunyip seemingly applied to all sorts of water demon type creatures cited by Aboriginals and White Australians. This part of the Bunyip story mirrors something said about the Australian big cats by folklorist David Waldron in his book, Snarls from the Tea Tree, Big Cat Folklore, which he co-authored with Simon Townsend. On pages 3-4 to four of the book, Waldron states that in the early history of big cat reports in Australia, the terms tiger and lion were pretty much applied indiscriminately by the media to any big cat-like creature. And really, I can see how that applies to the Bunyip also. On pages 191 to 192 of Out of the Shadows, it's stated that there appears to be some overlap between the Yowie and Bunyip, with some reports they came across of supposed Bunyips being giant, hairy ape men, something normally labelled as a Yowie. Some other good examples come from Carl Schuker's Still in Search of Prehistoric Survivors, where on page 415 it stated there was a reported 60 foot long, free headed animal covered with shiny scales reported from the Gujarama Creek. To 200 miles east of Darwin in the Arnhem Land Aboriginal Reserve. A two-headed creature was also reported in Tuckerbill Swamp near Leeton in New South Wales from between 1929 and 1930, which could reportedly change direction without changing gear. As Shuka points out, some of these reported bunyips, like the multi-headed creatures just mentioned, are most likely some sort of fanciful creation rather than an actual animal. Another good example is a creature lumped in with the bunyip called the Mulch rank, stared to be a half-human, half-fish, with a mop of reeds in the place of hair, said to have a booming voice and lives in Lake Alexandria. Malcolm Smith personally believes that it should not be lumped in with the bunyip. What's often recognised as the first, or one of the first, sightings of the Bunyip came around in the early 1800s. Reading straight from Gary Opitz's paper on the Bunyip from 2001's Myths and Monsters conference, the first European known to have lived in Victoria was the convict William Buckley, who escaped from the earliest settlement under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Collins in 1803. Buckley was a stonemason turned soldier who was apparently falsely arrested during an army uprising. After his escape, the settlement was was abandoned and he lived for 32 years with the Wofa Wurrung Aboriginal people in the Geelong area until the next attempt by Europeans to settle Victoria in 1835. He guided the first settlers around the district, described the cultural life of the tribal peoples that inhabited the land, and gave information on the plants and animals. He also described his attempts to identify the large, unknown aquatic animals that he often observed. In this lake, as well as in most of the others in land and in the deep water rivers, is a very extraordinary amphibious animal which the natives call Bunyip, of which I could never see any part except the back, which appeared to be covered with feathers of a dusky grey colour. It seemed to be about the size of a full-grown calf, and sometimes larger. The creatures only appeared when the weather is very calm, and the water smooth. I could never learn from any of the natives that they had seen either the head or tail, so that I could not form a correct idea of their size, or what they were like. When alone, I several times times attempted to spear a bunyip, but had the natives seen me do so, it would have caused great displeasure. And again, had I succeeded in killing, or even wounding one, my own life would probably have paid the forfeit, they considering the animal something supernatural. 
As Malcolm Smith points out in the addendum of the Bunyip chapter in his book, the word Bunyip originated with the Waharong language to the south and west of Geelong, which seems to validate Buckley's story. Smith also points out that, from research he did for his book The Truth About Bunyips, the actual Bunyip legends seem to be limited to central parts of Victoria and southern parts of it such as Port Phillip and Western Port, with everything else being a separate myth. However, in regards to William Buckley, it's worth noting that William Buckley's memoirs were published in 1852, and by then everyone in Australia knew about the Bunyip. Alongside that, William Buckley was illiterate, having hired a ghostwriter who might have taken some liberties in writing. Only thing validating him is that the word Bunyip originated where he claimed to have seen it. Also, just as a little side note, I found this part funny in Bunyips and Bigfoots, where Smith states on page 16 that Buckley and his fellow convicts who escaped imagined they could walk from Port Phillip to Sydney and then walk to California. You know, the same California that's on the other side of the world. Tony Healy and Paul Cropper on page 162 of Out of the Shadows state that when ignoring all the miscellaneous stuff lumped in as a bunyip, the Aboriginals believed in two different cryptid bunyips, the first being the dog-faced bunyip and the other the long-necked bunyip. Often described as looking like a dog, hence the name, the dog-faced bunyip has been reported very often, with 60% of reports by non-Aboriginals being this type according to page 166 of Out of the Shadows. This is compared to 20% that are only the long-necked variety. Edward Smith Hall in March of 1823 would write a letter to the Sydney Gazette where he reported that in November of 1821 someone shot at a water creature with a face like a bulldog with it rolling in the water before rolling back over and disappearing. The man who had fired the shot had loaded the gun with a large amount of powder, hurting his shoulder in the process, causing him to shut his eyes in pain. Another two men reported nearly hitting a dog-faced bunyip while in a rowboat. Tony Healy in Paul Cropper's book also goes over several other reported dog-faced bunyips for those wanting to read about them, although I will note you might have trouble finding the book due to it being out of print for so long. With the long-necked bunyip, another man would also report shooting at the creature, but would have no success. He also stated that he would have went after the animal and gone closer to it if it wasn't for the aboriginals telling him about its fury and strength, accompanied with the quote-unquote frail description of his boat and his gun only having one barrel. A naturalist by the name of Stockweller, when spending his time sailing up and down the Murray River, would encounter what he'd describe as freshwater seals and would show sketches of them to the local aboriginals. According to page 100. 70 of Out of the Shadows, they described them as the Bunyip's brother, presumably meaning a similar animal, or a duplicate. According to Stockweller, the animals had paddle-like limbs on the shoulders, a long, swan-like neck, a dog-like head, a pouch underneath the head like a pelican's, and the animals varied in length from between 1.5 to over 4.5 meters. However, it later turned out that he was misquoted, with the animals having no pelican's pouch. As for physical evidence of the bunyip, this is an interesting one in the form of the bunyip skull. As pointed out by page 171 of Out of the Shadows, scientific interest in the bunyip was at its peak in the early days of colonisation of Australia, with quite a few men of science being open to the possibility of a water beast of some kind lurking in Australia's river system, filling a similar niche to that of the hippo. This is clearly demonstrated by a thigh bone that was found believed to have been from a marine animal of some kind discovered in 1845 that would spark interest and cause Dr. Hobson, one of Melbourne's leading scientists at the time, to go out and try and find further remains that he believed might have been from a bunyip. The main example Healy and Cropper give is from Governor Charles Latrobe of the Port Phillip District. According to pages 171 to 172 of After Shadows, Latrobe took a personal interest in the bunyip due to not only believing the bunyip reports showed two different animals, but also him having had two bunyip sketches. He later sent them to Tasmania, but they would be lost to time at some point. According to the same citation, Latrobe also referred to the two types as the northern and southern bunyips, although it's not known which is which. The bunyip skull came around in 1846, or around that time. In 1847, Latrobe would write about it to a friend, Ronald Gunn, which would include a reconstruction of some kind with it, due to the front of the skull appearing to have been broken off. 
The skull was discovered by settler Athol T. Fletcher, who found it at a location on the lower part of the Murrumbidgee River, where a bunyip was reportedly killed by aboriginals. When asked about the skull, the natives said it was from a bunyip, known to them as the Katenpe, although it's not known how many Katenpe skulls the aboriginals had seen beforehand. The skull would be scientifically described by James Grant in the Tasmanian Journal of Science 1847 edition and was about 9 inches long, missing the bottom jaw, the front of the snout and the top of the cranium. According to Bunyips and Bigfoot's updated second edition, page 19, William S. Maclay examined the skull and believed due to the fragility and lightness of it and the sharpness of the tooth crowns that the skull belonged to a young, if not fatal animal, with some believing it to be a stillborn or miscarried animal. The skull still had ligaments and other assorted fleshy parts attached when found, indicating it was a relatively freshly killed animal, with it being believed that some of the flesh was scavenged by dingoes before someone found the skull. Uh, hang on ladies and gentlemen, I'm just gonna put my air conditioning unit on, because uh, without it I'm gonna die from the heat. So uh, if you hear any humming in the background, uh, now you know why. During 1847 and 1848, the skull would attract a lot of scientific attention. A similar skull was found and differed in having only one eye compared to the original skull, which had the eyes so far apart they pressed towards the back of the jaws. The second skull was that of a stillborn, deformed fetus of a ma that was found floating down the Hawkesbury River, and William Maclay believed the first skull to be that of a cult due to similarities. Sir Richard Owen, who named several extinct Australian megafauna and coined the word dinosaur, believed it to be nothing but a deformed calf skull, although it's worth mentioning that Owen never examined the skull in person himself and only had an illustration to work with. The original quote-unquote bunyip skull was housed at the Colonial Museum, now the Australian Museum of Sydney, before being moved into storage and lost to time. The second skull is still available and is on display at the Maclay Museum in Sydney University for those wanting to see an interesting piece of Australian cryptozoological lore in person. So as for the question of what exactly is, or was, the bunyip, due to the fact that quite a few different sightings have been labelled as bunyips, multiple identities have been proposed. In 1947, for example, on August 1st, three men reported seeing a creature near Swan Hill on a riverbank. Believing it to be a pig, they simply ignored it and got on with their day. A month or so later, when they saw the same animal swimming against the current and spouting water out the top of its head five feet into the air, they didn't exactly think it was a pig anymore. When they trained a spotlight onto it, the animal retreated into a shelter and began emitting a loud whistling noise they said could be heard half a mile away. Smith, at the time of him writing the original edition of his book, wondered what it was. By the time the second edition rolled around, he believed it to be nothing more than an out-of-place dolphin or beaked whale. However, it does beg the question of how it got there due to it having to most likely swim through several locks to get there, across well over a thousand kilometres of water bending in all sorts of directions. Moving on from the Swan Hill Bunyip report, one identity proposed for Bunyip sightings is that of Diprotodonts, such as Diprotodon itself. The main problem is that, as Darren Nash points out in Hunting Monsters' brief section on the Bunyip, reports don't describe anything Diprotodont-like. Malcolm Smith, on page 266 of his book, states the only evidence he could find was a comment about Diprotodonts in Bernard Wavelman's famous cryptozoological work on the track of unknown animals. In the book, Quavelmans states that prospectors had reported large rabbits to that of a man he described as a great Australian naturalist named Ambrose Pratt. Smith says he wouldn't have given such a title to Pratt due to having come across Pratt's best known work, The Call of the Koala, when he was studying koalas himself. Similar to how Smith put it, that work is enough to destroy anyone's credibility, with most experts in koalas seeing it as nothing but a load of rubbish. Smith states Wavelman's explained to him in a letter that he got the information on the protodonts from American cryptozoologist Ivan T. Sanderson. Considering it's nothing but a letter from Sanderson with ties to an unreliable person, it's not much to go off of as evidence. Perhaps there are some other lines of evidence for living diprotodon-like animals, but for now it's not much to go off of and I'll save anything else on the subject for a future video. Cryptozoologist Gary Opert, when addressing the two main types of bunyip that make up the majority of reports, believes the dog-faced, seal-like bunyip reports to be simply misidentified seals. Seals have been reported throughout Australian history swimming up rivers, sometimes over 1,000 kilometres inland in some cases, and in the occasional flood could get trapped in bodies of water not connected to said river systems. 
A bunch of the sightings also describe animals within the same size range as seals and sea lions known to inhabit or come to Australia. Some problems do arise, however, as an example of a Chalicum outline, an outline of a supposed dead bunyip that the Chaparong Aboriginals redrew and maintained until around the 1870s when the tribe faded out of existence, after which the outline was destroyed by cattle moving in. The Chalicum sketch was located at Fiery Creek near Ararat in Victoria, and a body of water there was reported to house the bunyip, with a local farmer never going out of his hut at night after seeing it. The outline measured roughly 11 paces, or 9 meters, according to page 163 of Out of the Shadows. According to them, this is far too big for your normal seal or sea lion, and even elephant seals are dwarfed by this. Healy and Cropper propose that the outline might have grown over time with each redraw and repair. However, according to the 6th edition of Walker's Mammals of the World, page 880, older reports suggest some specimens of the southern elephant seal reached 9 meters and over 5 metric tons. So, for all we know, the animal might have been an exceptionally large elephant seal, although I personally find the idea it grew as it was redrawn more plausible. As for the quote-unquote true bunyip, as Gary Opit believed it to be, Malcolm Smith believed the long neck bunyip can also be explained away as nothing but seals and or sea lions, since the long-necked part could just be a descriptive term. Sea lions can be said to have a long neck, considering some photos you might come across online. Gary Opert, however, believes that the long-necked bunyip could be the supposedly extinct Palachestes azale, citing that its remains are rare in the fossil record, which could mean that when alive it might have been a rare creature with low reproductive rates. The front arms were also, according to Opert, inflexible and the creature would have had trouble walking. Opert theorizes that Palachestes could have been responsible for the long-necked bunyip sightings. However, the long-necked bunyip sightings have dried up over time, and possibly could mean that if the long-necked bunyip was real, it might be extinct. So I guess Palorchestes is still extinct then, if it's behind the long-necked bunyip sightings. Given the reconstructions you can find online of the animal, I don't personally believe the long-necked bunyip was Palorchestes, and I find the seal theory more plausible than Palorchestes. There's also been some other, more obscure forms of bunyip as mentioned earlier, such as two sketches done by an aboriginal named Kurok, with one looking like an emu and the other a domestic cow. Aboriginals reportedly would sometimes point to the bones of cattle as bunyip bones, and Smith believes that it could possibly be the case that some emu-like creatures might have been inland reports of sea serpents. However, not all theories are without problems. As an example, aboriginals in range of some of the dog-faced and long-necked bunyips have hunted and killed seals. The aboriginals reportedly feared the bunyip as a devastating force of nature, so if seals were behind the sightings, why would the aboriginals try hunting something that's supposedly so dangerous and they so greatly fear? Another is loud booming calls attributed to the bunyip. According to Gary Opert, when he was staying at a friend's place, he asked their grandmother about the bunyip she supposedly heard in the area, and later explained the bittern bird to her. The bittern bird, due to its loud booming call, has been theorized to have been behind the bunyip's call. However, she responded saying she never heard of such a creature, and that it sounded nothing like the call she understood to belong to the bunyip. One thing that could be the case is that, as Darren Nash speculated in Hunting Monsters, and in his earlier work, The Cryptozoological, on Volume 1 with John Conway and C.M. Cozman that the bunyip might have been a marsupial that evolved an aquatic lifestyle. Some believe this to be impossible due to the pouch marsupials have, requiring the fetus to crawl from the mother's vagina to the pouch, which would be impossible to do with flippers. However, hardly anything is impossible with evolution. Several species of marsupials have lost their pouches over the course of evolution, or it could be the case that bunyips, if they are marsupials, have a watertight pouch like the water opossum of South America does. With this in mind, and descriptions given of the dog-faced and long-necked bunyip resembling seals, it could be the case that the two main bunyip types reported are marsupials that convergently evolved a seal-like build. Personally, I feel like the dog-faced and long-necked bunyips are most likely either seals or a marsupial that evolved a seal-like build. Anything else, such as the emu-like creatures and cattle, are probably separate animals being labelled as bunyips, like the ape-man bunyip mentioned earlier. Whatever the bunyip is, since the early days of settlement in Australia, the bunyip sightings have dwindled more and more with the damming of rivers and draining of swamps, to the point that I don't think we're going to get many modern-day reports of bunyips. 
To conclude this video, whether or not the Bunyip did or did not exist in the grand scheme of things doesn't appear to matter that much. The word Bunyip has become synonymous with imposter, pretender and other such words. The Bunyip has also become a popular children's character with multiple authors having written at least one or two children's books about the creature. The word Bunyip has even been used in Australian political lexicon such as in 1984 when it was used to describe that Bob Hawke's presidential style of leadership might result in a Bunyip monarchy. Tony Healy and Paul Cropper state it's also one of the sole cases of white Australians adopting Aboriginal culture on a grand scale. And that will be all for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and will like, share and subscribe as a result. I will admit this video might be somewhat inaccurate due to me being utterly confused at some parts when writing and having to rush to get it out in time for Australia Day. Alongside that, in 2020 Malcolm Smith published The Truth About Bunyips, which I wanted to get for this video but didn't think it would arrive in time, and I had also spent money on getting several other books for other projects. So if I ever get Smith's book, expect me to redo this video in extensive detail. Detail. However, until that time comes, I never want to hear the word bunyip again. Who knows, maybe after me saying that it will become my version of humanity. Anyway, with that out of the way, I'll see you next time I upload a video. Originate with the Warthorn language to the south. As Malcolm Smith points out in the addendum of the bunyip chapter in his book, the word bunyip originated with the Waha How do you say that? Originate with the Warthorn language to the south and west of Geelong. Uh, uh, pardon. Something nearly came up there, Jesus Christ.